Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, bringing you a look at the Georgia Bulldogs tonight with Savannah Lee Richardson from Bulldog Illustrated. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for the very best in college football coverage. We bring on the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the industry. And you also have to get stuck with some analysis from me as well. The uh, audio versions you can find on Google Play, Podbean, iTunes, and Stitcher. Savannah, how you doing tonight? Good. Just hanging out by the pool, enjoying this weather. It's finally stopped being rainy and then all the pollen the last few couple weeks. I mean, it's still pretty terrible, but it was finally a good day by the pool. <laughs> yeah, that is always a good time. Uh, kicking into summer mode. Good yeah. stuff there. But we're going to take you back to spring because we need to hear from you on the dog's performance in the spring. So based on going through 15 sessions of practices, the spring game, what you gathered from the other big scrimmages, uh, what hit you as being the big storylines for Georgia football in the spring? Well, we got hit with a, a bit of an injury bug with losing Divide Wilson and uh, Mark Webb in the secondary to two knee, knee injuries. However, Mark Webb should be back probably towards the middle of fall camp, hopefully. His was just a, a slight meniscus issue, but uh, Divide Wilson, he's still kind of up in the air. It was an ACL tear for him. Um, probably the biggest storyline, which people think – are thinking would be the quarterback battle, but I don't really think that it's much of a quarterback battle. I think Fromm secured his job very, very much so at the G day game, and along with the entire spring, he just looks like a, a complete quarterback and he looks like he's ready to continue his leadership. Um, Kirby smart made it known to tell his, the media that the secondary and the defensive line are lacking in in depth but I'm not sure if that's just him calling out people or that, and especially with the secondary telling him that they're not ready. Like God, he's like genuinely concerned about the secondary, but then at G day, they just kind of came out and exploded. So I don't know if it was a little more of a, Hey guys, step it up. I'm telling the media this and making you look bad. Or if he's genuinely concerned overall, the spring went very smoothly. I thought that, um, despite all the, the circling questions, losing Sony Michelle, no, uh, Nick Chubb, Bellamy, and Lorenzo Carter and all them, like we would have some holes and stuff, but a lot of the young guys seem to have stepped up, stepped up a good bit, and it's going to be an exciting fall camp. Yeah, so if we talk the quarterback situation, Jake Fromm did a very commendable job as a freshman last season. When he was counted upon, uh, when he finally had to make plays, he pulled through. Uh, that was the question much of the season. Yeah, this guy's playing well, but he's got – such a strong defense and supporting cast and running game. He rarely has to throw under pressure, under duress, pull out the big plays. But he did, most notably against Oklahoma, showed us that. Uh, I've got somebody on here, Big Poppy JT, who is just driving us nuts here with Justin Fields talk. He wants to hear about Justin Fields. Give us anything you've got. He seems to be, based on all the reports I hear, coming out of spring practice, he's the real deal. And he showed that that number one quarterback ranking was, um, was justified. It's definitely justified. He's an incredible athlete. He's a freak. He just has the build, the mold. He comes in very cool, calm and collected. He really didn't get rattled much. However, a lot of people, what a lot of people don't realize is the, like who he was playing against G day wise. Jake Fromm was going up against probably what will be the best team, the best defense in the SEC. As Justin Fields looks at it, he's playing against, now I don't want to sit here and say scrubs, but he's playing against the second and the third string and the guys that, that need a push to, to improve themselves. And especially that secondary, there was only, I think, one or two guys in that secondary that had seen um, a college football playing field last season at all, and that was a mere speed. And so I think that he did a great job. He showed so much, so much talent in spring. He's got an arm. That's the first thing that I had noticed about him on day two or three of, of spring camp. It's kids, not just a leg guy who can tuck it and run. He can chunk it just as far as, if not farther than, than Jake Fromm. Um, but again, again, like in G day, he had some great targets to throw to with JJ Hallman and Matt Landers. And they exposed that the, back into the secondary, but a lot of fans don't realize that the talent difference in the second string second, secondary and the first string secondary is a 
good margin a little difference. I've had quite a few debates on uh, the recruiting board at North at on Bulldog Illustrated along with some Facebook pages and stuff. And some people don't realize that, but at the same time, they did the exact same thing with Jake Fromm last year because he was playing against the the second and third string. Uh, secondary and defense last year and, and won the G-Day game. So it's a similar situation as last year to this year, but Justin Fields is a phenomenal athlete. He's going to do great things, and I, I'm excited to see how he can grow this season, helping Jake Fromm being that backup guy, and I'm sitting here predicting it. Not Nothing has been set in stone, but I think Jake Fromm has secured his job. Yeah, we should all understand that uh, there's few things to get clickbait in college football, like a good quarterback battle, especially for one of the teams that are uh, contending for a national championship, and especially with the number one quarterback in the country coming out of high school involved. Uh, so not a whole lot of talk uh, to talk about at this time of year, unless, of course, you're watching Mark Rogers TV, where we analyze everything to death and talk about schedules and, and are going to rank all the teams and everything. But uh, I think that's more clickbait. It's not much of a quarterback battle right now. You, you have to think, though, Savannah, that they're going to get Justin Fields on the field uh, in certain spots this year, get, get certain game situations, plays, and sets ready for him to excel and, and get his feet wet. Oh, without a doubt. I expect him to see the field plenty this season, especially against Austin P. And I think it's uh, – ooh, I can't think of the other kind of cupcake game that Georgia has later in the season. Um, but I do expect them. I, I think we're going to see him along with the with some RPOs and some quarterback reads and just various things just to, to get his feet wet, to not just throw him out there whenever Jake Fromm leaves and be like, all right, well, good luck. I think he's too talented to leave on the sideline. It's kind of hard not to, to put him in. And so I think it'll be really interesting to see what Coach Coley and Coach Chaney uh, decide to do with him this season. Um, I expect to see probably tucking in and running because he did a tremendous job doing that in, um, the, against the defense at G-Day. He made some good reads. But I also think we might get to see some long balls from him too because you got Matt Landers and uh, Tommy Bush who will be – who are two six four six five guys that just have some nice sets of hands that I'm excited to – to get to fall camp and see where they are and stuff. But yeah, I, Justin Fields will play, but he won't start. So we've got a number of folks on the line uh, with their comments and questions for Georgia football. So Vanna Lee Richardson joining us for from Bulldog Illustrated. So I'm going to try to tackle these and, uh, and uh, some of them general, some very specific. Let's In do it. In particular, uh, Big Poppy JT asking about Amir's speed. Defensive back out of Jacksonville. You familiar with him? I am. Amir Speed is a big bodied secondary guy. I think this season he's got a great opportunity to come in and, and compete for some playing time. I think it's it's he's got the physical aspect of it. Um, however, I think the biggest issue with Amir is is learning the, the playbook and, and getting that mental aspect and, and getting out there in front of ninety three thousand people every Saturday and, and putting it all together and not having a mishap here or there. Um, I, I fully expect him to get a lot more playing time this season. However, I think he'll be probably making more of an impact next year. At getting another full season under his belt, it will do him good wonders. He's so fast, though, and that's what's scary. He's like 6'1", 6'2", so he's really tall. He's got a thick body, but he's quick on his feet, too. His name mimics his, his style. <laughs> that was kind of cheap. Good name. You love when the name um, – is a good play on words for that particular athlete. Okay. So Savannah, you did mention a few minutes ago and I let it slide that Georgia has the best defense in the SEC. So, so we're going to be able to back that up here this season. I think so. I think the, despite losing, like I said, Lorenzo and Davin and John Atkins, Dominic Sanders and, and company, I think that Georgia's bringing in, it's just as much talent, if not probably more talented than the defense was last year. I remember uh, sitting on the sideline pregame with my boss. I don't remember exactly what game it was last year, but we overheard um, a TV person being like, this will be the worst defense we'll see in the next five years from Georgia. And I think that's the true testament right there because you have Tyler Clark, Jonathan Ledbetter, DeAndre Walker as a linebacker, Monty Rice who's coming in and, and looking at that Mike place where uh, – you know, Lord Roquan Smith was, and then you also have Nature's Patrick. I'll soon they forget. 
I know. It's just like, Lord, I have probably said his name a thousand times. And of course, this one time is going to slip up. But I think they've gotten guys that had playing time last year, but were behind the leaders. And um, the biggest thing that will help the success for this team is finding those leaders this year who are going to be vocal and who are going to be able to help lead the defense while they're on the field. The talent's there. It's just going to be finding those the guys that are going to step up and 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 be the ones that we need to do what Lorenzo and company did last year. Savannah Lee Richardson from Bulldog Illustrated talking up the dogs here on Mark Rogers TV. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for the very best in college football coverage. And I know that uh, there's a ton more people that could be subscribing because sometimes I'll go into the analytics and I got, let's say, a thousand views on a video and only like 50 of those people subscribe. So if you love college football, I don't know why you just watch the videos and don't subscribe. Please subscribe and uh, give me your likes and your comments. And, and if you don't like something, please argue with me. And uh, it uh, spurs on a little discussion and debate. We love that too. Oh, yeah. All right, Savannah, uh, tight ends. Ryan Mel, our guy Ryan, is asking about Georgia tight ends. Ooh, probably one of the most talented group of tight ends in the SEC. And, of course, I'm going to say that being a Georgia rider, but you have Isaac Nauta, a five, former five-star, and then you're also bringing in Luke Ford and John Fitzpatrick, of one of the top uh, tight ends for 2018 with Luke Ford along with Fitzpatrick. These guys are huge. I saw them at G-Day on the sideline, and I – I'm a pretty tall girl. Like I'm 5'9", almost 5'10", and I felt small. They're thick-bodied. I'm excited to see what they do. Luke Ford needed a little bit of work on his route running, so I'm excited to see what Chaney and them can can do considering that. But I think it's Isaac Nauta's time. He kind of cruised last season. Of course, you know, everybody says, oh, they didn't throw enough to the tight ends and stuff. But I think we're going to see that a lot more. I mean, you got Coley coming in who has a really big respect for them, along with Jim Chaney, who is now the tight ends coach and, and co-offensive coordinator because uh, Coley took over for, at quarterbacks. So I think that the tight ends are going to get a heck of a lot more looks. And you also have Jackson Harris who could come in and make a big deal. And I can't forget about Charlie Warner, you know, the Georgia legacy. I knew I was probably going to get some comments if I didn't mention him, but Georgia's stacked. Either way you look at it, it's going to be an exciting – position to watch for fall camp. I, Isaac Nauta must step up. I'm a big Isaac Nauta fan. I have watched him since he was a freshman in high school at Buford, but he has got to step up. I mean, he just cruised last year. I think he's got so much more throttle, so much more grit, and so much more power that he could be using. And so I, and that's what, that's one of my biggest expectations this, this, uh, for fall camp is seeing him explode onto the scene. Mark Rogers TV talking uh, Georgia football with uh, Bulldog Illustrated Savannah Lee Richardson, Ray LaRusso asking about the pretty weak schedule. So this isn't what I, I don't like. So I had a couple of video released uh, just in the last few days, Savannah, where I looked at uh, the future schedules for everybody in the SEC and actually all the power five conferences. And when I looked at Georgia, Georgia's not afraid to play anyone. They go out there, they schedule the likes of Notre Dame, and they've got some really exciting series coming up with the likes of UCLA and others. Uh, but this particular season, and and the other thing I respect about that coming from Georgia, Florida, Kentucky, and South Carolina is that you always have the other Power 5 game that you have to play against your rival. So you always play Georgia Tech, and then when you add on another Power 5 game against a Notre Dame, UCLA, or somebody else, that's that makes for an extremely tough schedule, but not this year. You didn't do that this year, so I, I'm not crazy about the schedule. I'm not crazy about the schedule either, but I get the point of it. I, I think you have those two easier games in there and to kind of soften the blow and get hopefully get two good, easy wins to show the, the playoff committee that we can destroy sub-level com opponents. However, I think that a lot of people will be surprised with South Carolina's um, that game too, I think it's going to be a lot more close than people are going to give it credit to. If Jordan now, we'll say if Georgia gets ahead in the first half, then it's then I don't think that South Carolina has the depth yet to come back and really do anything. How, but if they let South Carolina stick around, it's going to be a ball game until the last few minutes of the of the game. However, I think Georgia's depth is just what's going to help them the most with their schedule. I agree. It's really weak. I mean, going to LSU might might cause some havoc, but then you also you're getting Tennessee at home. You got Vandy at home, Auburn at home, and 
that to me is just like an awesome home home for fans to be able to come in and see. But yeah, I, I, I'm probably one of the few UGA riders that want this Clemson Georgia rivalry to happen because I firmly believe that Georgia and Clemson will be the two teams the next five to seven years, if not longer. And why not throw it at the beginning of the season, let them go head to head every year and let them meet again in the, in, at the, in the playoff. People are so worried that if whoever loses is going to, Oh, they're going to get knocked out. Not if you play it or you schedule it strategically enough. I'm, I don't like Alabama's schedule if we're really going to talk about schedules. Alabama has coasted and had some of the easiest schedules the last few years, and look what they've done with it. I'm, You know what? Easy schedule. That means Georgia should be in the SEC championship come December and then the college football playoff. So, But I, I like yeah, – if I'm, if I'm Georgia, I've got the Georgia Tech game. I've got three other games to schedule. I'm scheduling two softies. So I have no issue with two FCS or two group of five type games. Great. You can't yeah. beat yourself up every week. You play in the SEC. Two softies, Georgia Tech, and then you go out and you grab. Yeah, Clemson would be a great series, and we just saw that about five years ago, a home-and-home, home, two really good games against Clemson. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd be out there scheduling Texas and Penn State and Ohio State and whoever else that's a, a marquee matchup for me. And like you say, if, if you're Georgia and you win the SEC – you can lose that other game and it's not going to cost you as what we've seen based on the first four seasons of the college football playoff. So what Georgia has is, as you mentioned, the out of division schedule is extremely tough. They don't have Alabama, but they've got LSU and Auburn, probably the second and third best teams in the division. Mm -hmm. So it's a very difficult non-division schedule. You're talking about two teams that went seven and one and six and two in the SEC last year. But yeah, Austin P, you mentioned the the very important game against South Carolina right out of the gate. Game two, September 8th, Middle Tennessee. And then the other, the tune up for the Georgia Tech game is UMass yes. late in the season. So you get the three softies in Georgia Tech, but uh, tougher schedules to come in 2019 and beyond. Well, uh, let's see. Ryan says we need to play Justin Fields in the Austin P game, if nothing else, then to make South Carolina prepare for him. It's an interesting thought there. It is an interesting thought, but. I mean, Will Muschamp is a lot smarter than that. Will Muschamp knows better. Will Muschamp and Kirby Smarter are good friends. I mean, they know each other like the back of each other's hands. They, they, that's going to be probably one of the best. If as long as Will Muschamp keeps the job at South Carolina, some of the best state and state rivalries right there because Will Muschamp's cutthroat. He's going to come after the jugular every time, especially against Georgia. Yeah, so what Will Muschamp has showed us in this job, we knew he was one of the best defensive coordinators and minds in the country. Uh, he's turning into a head coach. Uh, he's learned what he let go at Florida, what he was not able to manage as a CEO of a program. He's a guy that's always going to be hands-on on the field, really dealing with the, the, the nuts and bolts and the X's and O's, but he obviously has to manage the entire program as well. So it's a balancing act, and he's doing it well at South Carolina. Three wins, then six, then nine. Uh, we'll see what happens in the next few years. It could be interesting. So, mm -hmm. Savannah, we've got uh, Cash Boy D, and we've got Dennis Wilson asking about Elijah Holofield and also <laughs> Malcolm Parrish. Your thoughts about those two guys? Malcolm Parrish is gone. Malcolm, Malcolm Parrish is gone. gone. But Elijah Holyfield, let me tell you, Mark, Elijah okay. Holyfield has been a topic of discussion for Bulldog Illustrated all these Facebook pages, and I have gotten destroyed because of my opinion. However, I think Elijah Holyfield has an ample opportunity to just take control this season and do what he wants to do. But in my opinion, I don't think he will. I think he's happy with what he's doing as the cleanup guy, getting you know those six or seven carries a game, averaging six or seven carry, like six or seven yards, getting those big uh, bursts of runs, but he has the capabilities of to be a starter. He would be a starter anywhere else in the SEC, but at Georgia, you have better backs in front of him. I've had people tell me that they're not sure about what Swift's going to be able to do as a premier back. Swift came in as a freshman and challenged Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle. If he would have gotten five or six handoffs, more a game, he would. We would. Ha Georgia would have had three running backs with a thousand plus yards. He is explosive. He is instinctive. 
And for anybody to think that Swift is not going to be that premier back, I'm sorry, but he is. And then you also have folks exiling Zamir White because he got hurt. I'm going to tell you right now, Mark, that injury is not near severe. So Elijah Holyfield has to really come in and compete his tail off if he wants to get that number two spot. A biggest, My biggest thing is he hasn't shown me anything to change that opinion of him being that cleanup guy. I mean, I have I see him downtown Athens, enjoying it, having a good time. He's of age. That's fine. Everybody needs to have a beer every now and then. And then another thing people tell me all the time is, oh, my God, but he's so big. His arms are so big. I'm like, that doesn't make a great running back, though. He has the dedication in the gym because look at him. He's cut up. He's cut up from head to toe. It's just there's some disconnect. I'm not sure if it was, you know, the old weed charge or what, but there's not – he's not doing what he did because if he's as good as everybody says he is, he would have came in and competed against Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle and tried to earn that number three spot. But he got beat out by Swift because Swift outworked him. I'm sure I'm going to get loads and loads of comments about this, but until Elijah Holyfield shows me he can do something against a first-string defense because he couldn't do anything against our first-string defense at G-Day, and people say, oh, it was the O-line. The O-line played fine. Yeah, we still have some missing pieces there working too, but the thing about it is is Georgia has one of the best, if not the best, up seven front, but you also got to play against Auburn. Kentucky has a big def- defensive front. LSU's got a big defensive front. And I don't he didn't do anything for me to impress me. So until he does, my opinion will stay the same and he'll be the third or fourth string running back. You got a couple <laughs> amens here. And yeah. you know that I love the strong take. So you can always bring the strong take here because I know that you've done your homework to back it up. So that's that's a good thing. Uh, well, we're kind of running out of time, unfortunately, okay. because there's a ton of uh, questions and comments here to get to, and I'm not going to get to well, anywhere close to uh, the, the good ones. But there's one that uh, the portion that I'm at to here in the chat from Ryan Mel. Again, he's asking about uh, transfers, a, a bit concerned with all the transfers. I don't think it's a really big concern. I think this is my whole synopsis about the situation. Coach Smart came in, probably sat down the entire team. And now this is all in my head. This is not fact. This is me contemplating, thinking, and just throwing my opinion out there. I think they had a meeting and they say, you have two years to really prove to us that you can make an impact on this team, that you can compete for the first and second string positions, or we will find a a better place for you. And I think that's what's happening with a lot of these players, Jaleel Loggins and Pat Allen and Chris Barnes. They're in position groups that are so stacked talently it's almost unfair for some of these kids not to transfer out because they'll never, they would never get the opportunity to really prove how good they are. I think Jaleel Loggins is a hell of a, excuse me, heck of a, of a player. And I think he could do You're great things. <laughs> it could do great things at wherever he goes along with Pat Allen and Chris Barnes. There's just better talent at Georgia. You are cutting numbers. You are trying to hit that 85 mark, and you are trying to to look ahead for the 2019 class too. So I think transfers are going to happen until Kirby Smarts gets all of the personnel of his own in there, and he knows the guys that he's bringing in are going to come in, compete for these spots where you won't see near as many transfers. But then you also have guys that are medically not going to be there anymore with – the offensive lineman, uh, Sam Madden, who has some some medical issues there. It's not. I'm not sure about Michael Chigbu, but Coach Smart did say that he is thinking about stepping down from football. Um, and then also Marshall Long, the punter, just had his third knee surgery. So there are some other things that look that are happening to scholarship guys that are just out of their control with their that the injuries and stuff. But I mean, I expect a transfer to happen, big times expecting it. But that's just we're we're trying to make numbers. But he's also trying to like give other people who are transferring the best opportunity to be able to get playing time and to be able to get to that next level in the NFL. So there's no way to get to all these comments. Uh, we could bring you back on and certainly uh, get through all the questions and comments. Uh, I'll say that uh, some people are having fun talking about Drew Locke uh, going to rip up your secondary this season. I mean- I like to see that happen. I mean, you know, you got DeAndre Baker, probably one of the best secondary players in the entire country. He didn't do anything against DeAndre Baker last season. And then you also have Tyson Campbell coming in. Uh, Joseph Nibod, I think that's how you say his name. 
Uh, there's so many guys, talented guys. Uh, Richard LeCount. Richard LeCount is ready to go. He is probably the most amped up guy in the secondary. It's funny. Kirby caught, like, calls him like a bouncy guy. He bounces around. You got to like tone him down. And that's one of the biggest things with Richard is toning him down and getting him molded into being the great D-back that he could be. And then you also have J.R. Reed, probably one of the smartest – God, one of the smartest secondary players in the entire country. You got two of them right there with DeAndre Baker and J.R. Reed. I mean, there's probably going to be some hiccups here and there, but by the time we get to Missouri, I think it's just going to be chug a lug. You're going to have I – mean, you don't have to stop Natrez Patrick, Tyler Clark, Jonathan Ledbetter, DeAndre Walker from getting to Mr. Drew Locke before you have to really worry about him getting to the secondary. But <laughs> I like right. answering the Mark. parting shot from Dennis Wilson talking about uh, Mark Rick coming into Georgia, stealing all the best recruits. Where I don't has, know what that has to do with what anything. Recruits have he stolen out of the state of Georgia? Because didn't we go in and steal Tyson Campbell from South Florida? Last season, uh, exactly. That was an easy one for you to, it, to have I you like finish it. <laughs> I like answering questions. Savannah Lee Richardson in fine form tonight from Bulldog Illustrated, uh, taking your comments and questions. I wish we could keep it going, but we've got to move along and uh, let Savannah, I don't know, get back to the pool or whatever her plans are for the uh, evening. <laughs> it's all recruiting now. I got to figure out who's coming this weekend and, and get some articles up. <laughs> all right, Savannah, we appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me.